The second case for the docket on Tuesday, December 14th, 2021, is appeal number 123302, State of Kansas versus Brandon T. Evans, Sedgwick County, briefs both sides. We are ready to proceed, Your Honor. Council, if you'd please come up and enter your appearances and then return to the council table, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Kristen Batty appearing for the appellant, Brandon Evans, present and ready for argument. May it please the court. May it please the court, Assistant District Attorney Lance Gillette on behalf of the state of Kansas, present and ready for argument. Thank you, counsel. Patty, you may begin when. And your honor, may I reserve three minutes for rebuttal? Uh, this is Mr. Evans, Brandon's, because we actually have um, at least one other um, participant in this case, um, a brother um, was a witness um, who's also named Evans. Um, this is his direct appeal from his conviction of first degree murder, aggravated battery, and criminal possession of firearm by a felon. Um, what we know for sure, I suppose, is that on a very, about 3 a.m. on a morning in June 2018, the victim in this case, Isaac Lewis, went to a club and was denied entry. He then came back about eight minutes later, and the video from the entryway shows him slipping some money to the guard who had wanted him. And this, then he comes in. The next thing we see, at least on that camera, is less than five minutes later, he's leaving, and my client, Brandon, comes up and shoots him in basically the back of the head, and there are also two other shots fired. Um, one goes and injures somebody else. That's how we get the aggravated battery. What's disputed is what happened in those five minutes, not even five minutes, inside the club. Um, I guess I should also say, under Mr. Lewis's body, there was found a loaded gun. What's disputed is what happened inside the club. And of course, clubs are noisy places. So there's certainly a lot of room for dispute. Um, Brandon says that Isaac brandished a weapon, threatened him, and even pointed it at him and pulled the trigger, but the gun didn't fire. As it turns out, the firearm, the state's firearm expert in this case, had trouble determining that yes, it was a functioning firearm because it was so dirty, and I don't know a lot about guns, but it was so dirty that it wouldn't fire. So what Brandon says is particularly plausible. The issue in this case is whether trial counsel Quentin Pentman was ineffective because he failed to put together those two pieces of evidence he was so focused on the fact that the video of what was inside the club proved that Mr. Lewis actually did not fire any shots, that he didn't consider the possibility that what Brandon said could be true, that Brandon could have had a very plausible self-defense theory and theory of defense of others. Because, you know, as I stated, he was there at the club with two of his brothers, and they also were expecting a cousin to arrive. Um, Council, was, was that the argument that was made at the Van Cleve hearing? I realize that the state has raised a preservation issue, and I suppose that the attorney who represented um, Mr. Evans in that hearing might not have pieced this all the way together as well. 
So um, I didn't see it that way. Um, and as you know, I did not file a reply brief. I think in, you know, when um, Brandon says in his motion um, that I told Pittman that he pointed the gun and tried to fire at it at me um, in his in the pro se motion um, that that's in I've got volume one page 171 172 um, in my notes, um, I think that's part of it, and I would argue to you as far as preservation that then putting together the piece that the firearm expert then supported his, what Brandon said, um, adequately preserves this for appeal. Uh, otherwise, as you know, we're back here on a 1507 um, that Mr. Wagle didn't piece this together, that I didn't um, argue the 602, Rule 602 exceptions. Um, but I saw it as being part of the argument. But, but are there district court findings on that particular theory? I, I do not recall. Um, and I did not um, bring anything like an electronic device so that I could look at the record um, with me this morning. Um, what we do know is that Mr. Pittman certainly realized it by the time that he got to closing. He even says in closing to the jury that he th it is particularly plausible that Isaac pointed the gun at Brandon and it just didn't go off. The problem is, first of all, we don't have Brandon telling the jury that. So, you know, as you've held in other cases, when you've got a self-defense claim and you don't have the defendant actually testifying to the self-defense, you don't really have anything there. Um, the other problem is there was a motion for stand your ground immunity um, in pretrial proceedings. And um, because of the discussions between Brandon and Pittman um, in preparation for that, Brandon also did not, as part of that proceeding, testify that Mr. That Lewis <clears throat> um, fired the gun and it just didn't go off. I'm having a little bit, had a little bit of trouble putting together my argument for this because it's so fact specific. And as you know, there's not really any, I guess I've given you some case law um, to kind of piece something together. Um, but this is something that's really difficult to, I couldn't find any sort of case really like this. It, um, counsel, it is the, <clears throat> is the argument basically that defense counsel was um, ineffective for failing to adequately make the self-defense claim? Yes. So all of this, the coercion, the, the details, really all filter up to self-defense. There's no other theory of defense, right? Well, except for the defense of others. It can, okay. it can be... Def self-defense or defense of others. Yeah. So then my question becomes, based on the facts that you recited at the very outset of your argument, mm -hmm. how could this... You know, you have a victim leaving who then is pursued and shot in the back of the head. How, how can that, it, I guess the right way to put it is, why is any of that other evidence even relevant, given those facts? Well, Brandon testified that um, he thought that his cousin Quinn was coming to the club. And for all he knew, that when Isaac was leaving, that Quinn would be entering and Quinn would be killed um, because of the threats that um, Isaac had made um, to Brandon in the club. As a matter of law, do even if those facts were 100% were true and believed by the fact finder, would that constitute self-defense? I, I struggle with that. It no, seems like I, it but, wouldn't. But, it, but defense of others. <laughs> or, or defense of defense others. Defense of others. Well, the other part of it is, at least as far as the 
um, the self-defense part goes. Um, there, as I recall, there maybe was another more like a fire exit that w was, you know, available. But basically, there's only one way, point of entry and exit. So in a certain sense... I just sense, can't get around the fact the victim was leaving. Right. And you don't have to go shoot him in the back of the head sure. to defend anyone. And, and I understand that. I guess I would also say is, you know, from Brandon's perspective, there's no other way than to go out the same way Lewis left. And if you try to leave, how do you know he isn't in the parking lot? Or how do you know that he doesn't um, go out to the parking lot, figure out how to get the gun working, come back again, and shoot him? You know, you, you really don't know in that moment um, whether you are safe if you stay. So that's where I suppose, you know, both self-defense and defense of others. Do we have somewhere at the district court level where the deficiency led to prejudice? I mean, there's a conclusory statement as it says that the defendant was prejudiced by this, by the performance of counsel, but there's nothing really detailing exactly how um, his performance prejudiced the defendant, and especially in light of all the evidence implicating him in the in the crime. I. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Um, I would all, also, all that seemed to be offered was just a conclusory statement, and typically that's not enough sure. to meet the second prong. I, I, I suppose the, the problem also is um, if you don't find that the performance is deficient, then do you even have to reach the issue of prejudice? And because the district court did not find um, deficient performance here, um, and like I said, I, I don't recall right off the top of my head, um, but it's possible that the district court did not even reach that issue. Um, and then, of course, I suppose we could argue that Mr. Wagle should have asked for <laughs> additional findings, right? So, my time is expiring um, if there are no other questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. May it please the court, Assistant District Attorney Lance Gillette on behalf of the state. Um, I guess I'll just touch on, on a few of the arguments that have been made here today. I think uh, the one thing that opposing counsel and I agree on is that this case is pretty fact specific and that's why the state spent um, a considerable amount of time laying out those facts and making it absolutely clear um, that A, the defendant did not raise his claim that Mr. Pittman overlooked uh, some conspicuous piece of evidence below, nor does he acknowledge that he's making that claim for the first time on appeal. The record also makes it abundantly clear that not only is that, that, that that claim is completely baseless. Mr. Pittman did not overlook that piece of evidence. Indeed, he used that piece of evidence to try to impeach some of the state's witnesses. He even argued as part of closing argument that perhaps the victim in this case uh, had tried to pull the trigger in the courtroom. The simple fact of the matter is the defendant was in a much better position thanks to Mr. Pittman's representation in this case. That's because I heard from the podium today that the defendant did not know in the moment that he may be in he or someone else may be in danger. If that's true, then he's not entitled to claim self-defense or defense of others under KSA 2152-22B. That statute requires a reasonable belief, reasonable belief that the use of deadly force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to such a person or a third person. Mr. Pittman placed the defendant in a much better place to assert a defense uh, of self or defense of others claim. Uh, as far as, uh, so again, there is no deficient, the, the first claim about overlooking the gun is not preserved. There is no deficiency because it wasn't overlooked. It was in fact used. There could be no prejudice here. 
Uh, if there are no questions on that portion of defendant's claim, I'll move on to the, uh, the allegation about trying to get the defendant and his brother to change their claim or change their story. And I think that, again, there's some factually driven um, information here that's absolutely important for this court to understand. The record in this case is clear that Pittman did not tell or coerce the defendant to or his brother to try to lie in any way, shape, or form. They told him a lie uh, at the very first time he met them, that they claimed that the, def that the victim in this case had actually fired shots inside this club. Mr. Pittman knew that to be a lie, and that's important, that he knows it to be untrue, because then he does what's required of him under the ethics rules and counseled them that, I know this is a lie. If you tell this lie, you will be convicted. Uh, and this court can tell that any claim of shots being fired inside the club before defendant uh, basically executed the victim in this case uh, is a lie, because there, nobody flees from the club until the defendant shoots. And it's just... Uh, shocking case of serendipity that there were officers in the parking lot with body cams rolling uh, at the time that these shots were fired and we know nobody was fleeing the club. What Mr. Pittman did was counsel the defendant and his brother to tell the truth. In addition, he gave them the opportunity to do so. He gave them the opportunity to testify that the victim in this case had tried to pull the trigger or pulled the trigger inside the club. The defendant and his brother just simply never did that. Amongst their, it's difficult to count different versions uh, of the facts. At no point did they ever claim that the trigger was pulled. The state even asked open-ended questions, giving them the opportunity to claim that the trigger had been pulled inside the club. No, and he never made such a claim or never testified to that fact. So Mr. Pittman's representation was not deficient. He knew that the first account of the victim shooting inside the club was a lie, counseled the defendant and the witnesses exactly as he's required to do. And again, there can be no prejudice here as well, because even if we assume the defendant's claim to be true, because Pittman argued that maybe the victim had pulled the trigger based on the evidence. Um, to this same end, uh, you know, the defense try, a defendant tries to fault Mr. Wagle somehow. Um, but again, what we're trying to talk about here, defendant had every opportunity to make the claims, the first claim in, in particular, um, that he tries to raise in appeal, and he just never did so below. Um, so there's the, we can't shift any kind of fault or ineffective analysis onto Mr. Wagle simply because the defendant um, failed to make a claim. Um, the only other thing I guess that I would, I guess I would summarize, um, again, there is clear video. There was a typo in the state's brief. I think I referenced state's exhibit 104 twice in one citation, but I was talking about 103 and 104, the exhibits that I added to the record that show the defendant come up from behind, uh, Mr. Lewis, as he's leaving the club, shoot him in the head, shoot him in the back as he's going to the ground and then shoot him again on the ground. That, is, that was powerful evidence. That is, that is evidence that's frankly somewhat hard to watch. Um, but one other thing is important that is shown from all of the evidence in this case is um, there were some questions from Justice Siegel about exits and other opportunities. There are multiple exits to this club. The cameras uh, from the officers, uh, especially going into the club and seeing the people flee the club, there are multiple ex exits. There are security. There was security <coughs> there. The defendant absolutely knew um, that the security was there and how to get their attention. Uh, he just never did so. He told a web of versions of events um, and is trying to do so yet again on, on appeal. Then I recall that the trial court made a specific finding about the availability of the exits, the number of exits. Those things that you've just um, mentioned about the security and everything else, those were specific findings made by the trial court, as I recall. Is that, is yes. that your recollection? Yes, I believe, I believe that is the case. That, um, there, there were other avenues here. There, there, was no, there was no factual basis for the defendant to, uh, despite instructing on it that <clears throat> the defendant had other avenues 
to seek safety, to seek help, to draw attention to things. And, and if there are no further questions, uh, I would just respectfully uh, state that I believe that Mr. Pittman's representation in this case was um, frankly exceptional given the difficult facts that he was facing and the ever evolving versions of events offered by his own client. Uh, there was absolutely no ineffective assistance here. And even if we assume some kind of ineffective assistance, there could have been no prejudice in this case. No, no further questions. I thank this court for its time. How do you reserve three minutes? You know how I write my briefs. I love to weave quotes in when I can, and I did a lot of quoting in this. Um, at the bottom of page three of my brief, um, I do at least say that, point out that Brandon testified that Lewis told him, you were going to die, and then I'm going to start with this motherfucking Quinn outside. So defense of others. Um, like we said, um, Brandon believed Quinn was um, on his way to the club. And for all Brandon knew, um, Lewis had seen Quinn in the parking lot. Um, and Lewis simply got to Brandon before um, Quinn did. Um, the yes, Mr. Pittman used the firearms expert in closing. Again, um, Brandon would suggest that by then it was too late. Um, he did not cross-examine the, um, the expert um, when the expert testified, I suppose, you know, to emphasize that point to the jury. Um, you know, opposing counsel said, well, no one flees until the victim is shot. Well, yeah, that's the whole point. If, um, as Brandon says, if Isaac fought, you know, produced the gun and attempted to shoot Brandon inside the club and the gun simply didn't go off, then no, no one would have heard. And there was nothing for anyone to hear. And the, um, and no one would have fled. Um, what we hadn't discussed quite yet is Kansas Rule of Professional Conduct 3.3 um, says that a lawyer may not knowingly offer evidence that she knows to be false. And it's doubt in the falsehood. Um, opposing counsel has pointed out um, where Brandon's story may have changed. Um, still, um, Brandon suggests that there's no way that um, Mr. Pittman could not have known or not have known um, what the truth was. Um, he was ineffective. We would request that um, his convictions be reversed and he be granted a new trial. And if there are no other questions, thank you. thank you. Thank you to both counsel for your arguments in this matter. The court will take this appeal under advisement.